Good morning, Year 12. How's it going, everybody? It's Friday. Woo! And it is the last lesson of energetics. We're drawing it to a close today. So um, I, I know that I set you guys a homework on bond enthalpies. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to finish off the AS content. It's the first so, thing. Uh, 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 sorry about that. <laughs> I have to have the YouTube video up just to make sure the sound's all working. Now I can get rid of that and I can leave the chat popped out. Amazing. So um, I'm going to finish off the content today. So we're boxed off and you're good to go with your energetics test, which is on Tuesday. Um, and as soon as I finish the content, I will then look at the bond energy and energy um, homework that you've set. So as soon as we as soon as we finish content, we'll move on and we'll cover that homework. Uh, if not, what I'll do is I'll record that. I'll record that over the weekend. I'll do it live on YouTube, and if you want to then join in that one, if when you see that, you know, if you're subscribed to my channel, it'll pop up saying this Duncan is live doing bond enthalpy homework with you. You can enjoy. It. Anyway, but you can always watch it back later. Anyway, so let's crack on, guys. Let's share my screen. Let's crack on. Switch to tablet mode. Hello. Oh, no, God, I'm Yorkshire. Right. Okay. Need to make sure. Got fan on. Laptop had tiny hissy fit. Laptop had crashed yesterday. Like, proper crash, too. Like, blue screen crashed. Not good. So just going to make sure that's all set up. We're good to go. Amazing. So three learning objectives to go today, guys. So... We have got calorimetry, energetics, calorimetry part two. So what we're doing today is number one, I need you to understand the internal calorimetry graph and you can add on a little extension to this. And I need you to understand the function of extrapolation. Yeah, extrapolation. Yeah, <clears throat> and the assumptions that we have to make for those. Next, the practical steps for external. Now, technically, this one is actually GCSE, but uh, I've been going through all the various papers um, online over the last couple of weeks, and I keep seeing this one reappear, and I'm just going to mention that one. Um, number three, be able to predict reaction rates based on bond data. Now, this has a very specific focus. This is focused on haloalkanes. And as I said, that we will have a look at those, go all the way through it. Okay, so internal calorimetry and their graphs. So first things first, just to remind us, internal calorimetry, calorimetry, internal calorimetry is the better of the two. We know this. This is the one where you have a polystyrene cup. This is the polystyrene cup one inside a beaker, usually to stand it up. You've got your solution. Yeah, that's usually going to be an acid of some variety. And then you've got your reaction. Let's call that one something like potassium carbonate. Yeah, and we can then measure the heat change inside it. Uh, immediate improvement, add a lid. Yeah, that's one of the key things that is very common yeah, a lid would be a good improvement. Lid improvement. Yeah. Very common. Okay, so now the reason why this graph is so important is because, because we have a situation where the heat loss is very carefully managed. The insulation is good. Now, what this means is um, that the heat loss that we're going to get, so the first, first bullet point we need here is some facts, which is the heat loss, the heat loss is far smaller, far smaller than external, than external cal, and bullet point number two, um, it's, relatively, and this is an assumption, it is relatively constant. Because, because the insulation remains the same throughout the entire process, and because the reaction isn't dancing about like the way an external flame does, that the, the heat loss is relatively constant throughout the entire practical. Now, what this means is that during this, so we can actually do this, we can say, that there is going to be a very small amount, I'm just gonna 
change the thickness of that pen, there is going to be a very small amount of heat loss in this practical, a very small amount, yeah? And it's going to be relatively consistent throughout the practical. What that means is when we graph it, we'll be able to actually take it into account. So let's now have a look at what the graph looks like. So when you graph this practical, on the x-axis is time, and usually in minutes, minutes. And what we have here is our temperature temp in degrees C. Right, so what now happens is that when you set the whole practical up, what you actually do is, I mean, I'm gonna show you this in a diagram as well. When you set the practical up, you add your solution. We know that the water is the bit that's the fluid. The solution is the bit that's going to capture the heat, yeah? So in this case, if I've added hydrochloric acid, 50 centimeters cubed, 0.2 moles per dm cubed. Yet yeah, we know that the Q equals the Q equals mc delta t. The m is the 50 centimeters cubed, which translates to 50 grams. Yet yeah, it's the solution that's capturing the heat. Now, what we would do is we would measure the temperature of the water for the first three minutes without the reaction happening. So when we do this, now by the way, this graph is important to realize that we're going to start at about 20 degrees here. We don't, this little line here, we don't do that line in chemistry, we ignore it. We start at 20, let's say the temperature, let's say then, let's say it goes to, I don't know, uh, 30 and then 40. Right, what we're now gonna do is we're gonna record the temperature for the first three minutes without adding, so this would be time in minutes, and this would be the temp, this is the table you'd see, yeah? And we would see minute one, minute two, minute three, and then minute four would have an X on it, and then minute five, et cetera, yeah, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, this will now continue. And what that means is you actually record these first three minutes are taken when, when no, when no, uh, re, when no, when only solution, only solution. So we haven't added in so not added K2CO3. Yeah, we've not added that in. So uh, by the way, I'm actually gonna change that. I've decided I don't wanna add K2CO3. I'm using that as the connection. I'm gonna add some zinc. Um, I'm gonna add some zinc to this instead. Let's do this, yeah, let's stick with that. So what we're now gonna do is we're gonna record the temperature of the acid at minutes one, two, and three, and we're not going to add, and the temperature I'm gonna say is 23 degrees. So it's quite a warm lab, yeah? And what you'll notice is the temperature hasn't changed, and of course it hasn't. The temperature hasn't changed, of course, because we haven't added anything to the reaction. This is, in the homework, there was a graph with the axis labeled with squiggly line on the graph. So if we put it, is that still fine? Do not put it, Oliver. I know that Edexcel have used it, but please don't use it. Just ignore it. I know that they did in the exam question. I remember seeing that one uh, on, on the, when it came out on the paper. I didn't even know I'd include it on the homework. Don't do it. Please don't do it. You don't need to in chem. Yeah, this is a real science, not one of those physics and biology stuff. So uh, we've got, it, the temp temperature of the acid was 23 degrees, all the three, all the three for the first three minutes nothing was added. Now we could have got, we might have seen a tiny temperature rise to 24. We might have seen that. And that would just be because the room is warmer than the solution and it's warming up, but you'd still just take a, a line of best fit for those three. At minute four, we skip it. At minute four, we take no reading. Yeah, and what we do is we add, add the zinc. We add the zinc at minute four and we do not take the temperature. Then what we do is at minute five and onwards, so five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, what we're now gonna do is record the temperature consistently at those minutes. I'm just gonna move my diagram out of the way and put the bottom of the beaker back on, lol. Right, so what's now gonna happen is you're gonna get a graph that looks a bit like this. 
at minute five, minute six, minute seven, minute eight, minute nine, minute 10, you'd actually stop at that point. If I continue, that would actually be the end point of that practical. And 12, yeah, there we go. So just to let you know, at this point in the practical, we would have stopped here. I'll tell you why, because we've got three consecutive decreases of the same value. Now, the reason why this is important is because this part of the graph tells us, tells us the heat loss, the consistent heat loss during this practical. It's flagging up this bit, yeah? It's telling us how much heat is being lost per minute. Now, just to let you know, if you did actually continue doing this, it would eventually level off and slow down like this if you were to actually continue doing that. So you actually never take it that far because what you want is a, a steady decrease, yeah? So what that now means is I can now do extrapolation. So here's my extrapolation, guys. I'm gonna change my color if I can. Extrapolation number one. So this extrapolated line, but people often say, what does extrapolated mean? This section here is the extrapolated part. Yeah, this is extra extrapolated. It means extended, 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 uh, using trend, using a trend. Now, because we can see that there's a nice steady, you know, this, this reaction hasn't really increased at all. I'm, I'm going to put back that minute three being the same as the previous ones. And then I can just say, oh, yeah, so there's our extrapolated. It's doing so well on that. I, I managed to get the line to work. Let's try that again. There we go. There's my, and, and I'm extrapolating it to minute four. That's what I'm doing here, folks. Yeah, this section I am extrapolating because I'm after this imaginary bit of data. Yeah, now, now I can extrapolate the straight line from the temperature decrease. I'm going to do this in purple. So I'm going to go there where I would have stopped. That didn't work at all. Well done, Mr. Duncan. That, that's not my fault, guys. It's not, I'm gonna see if I can now move this. Darn it. I'm gonna see if I can now move this. Okay, it's still not working. Okay, that's not working at all. I'm gonna use my mouse. See if I can use my mouse to alter this. Uh, okay, that's kind of in the right thing, and then I can hopefully move it to that. I don't know why it does this. Oh, oh, that's what I want right there. And then all I want to do is extend it. You're having a laugh. Uh, oh, it now seems to be working. Don't know why. There we go. And I don't need this massively ridiculous extension tail. There we go. That'll do. Right. And I have extra this. This is the region that's extrapolated. Yeah. And what I'm doing is I'm extrapolating to minute four. I'm going to use a ruler in my exam. You'd always use that. It's not a good idea that I'm going to use a ruler. Yeah. And be able to now extrapolate, use my two extrapolated lines to work out the correct delta T with the heat loss factored in. So this now here, using the, the two extrapolated lines, yeah, the two extrapolated lines, which are these, yeah, I can now work out a, a delta T for minute four factoring in the heat loss. And that is now my delta T. And I read that off, you know, again, using a ruler. So that would be 39 degrees there, 23 start. Yes, there's, and I do my delta T of 39 minus 23 and I get my delta T. So this extrapolating is so, so good. Like you can actually do a classroom practical and get pretty close to the real answer. And you're talking like within a few percentage, and this is the kind of thing where I was meant to be doing a, a learning objective today on looking at total practical error versus equipment error. 
but I'm going to do that when we're back at school and we've got a practical to do that with. It makes more sense to do so. So anyway, guys, that's the whole point of this. It's using notice. By the way, please just emphasize I ignored those two because the reaction's still going on. We need the steady straight line decrease, yeah? And if you had, like, if, if I just plot a whole load of ridiculous versions of this, one, two, three, straight line, and then, um, you know, and I get something like this. Yeah, what you realize is you ignore that latter tail bit. Because what's happening is uh, the, the reaction there is it's now when you approach room temperature, the heat loss will actually start to reduce. So you ignore all of those bits. The only bits you use, darn it. The only bits you use are the straight line ones, which are there. There you go. I'll use those four. Those would be very reasonable. There we go. Extrapolate that to minute four. Extrapolate this one to minute four. Yeah, and then go, right, where's my delta T? There's minute four. And I go, right, boosh, there's my, there's my delta T. Yeah, my delta T is from here to here. That's my delta T. Yeah, let's do another one. Let's do it. Let's do an, a negative one. Yeah. So what would happen if we were doing it? That was an exothermic reaction. Let's do an. Um, sorry, that was an exothermic. Let's do an endothermic. So we're going to start once again at twenty-one degrees Celsius, and we get three of the same temperature, and we can extrapolate that line, and then we add it, and it's endothermic, so the temperature drops. And the graph would look like this. And it would then start to come back up again. I need to realize that I'm going to shoot myself in the foot here because I'm going to run out of space on my graph. So I'm going to go. There we go. Perfect. So there's my endothermic graph. I'm sorry that it's not entirely like there we go. Uh, I just need to move them all now. You, you kind of get the point I'm trying to make here. Right. Extrapolate both lines. Ruler. Uh, uh, nope, nope, ruler. There we go. Horizontal line for these three. Boom. Extrapolate to minute four. And then I've extrapolated that too far. Right, there's my extrapolation for this one. The straight line ones. There. I'm going to move that ever so slightly so it's actually on the points. There we go. Extrapolate this line. Right, to minute four. Right. And then... My delta T was minute four, which is here. I'm sorry that they're so far away, guys. Let, let me move this. It's only because I was just fiddling around trying to make sure that the data fitted onto the graph. There you go, that should look a bit better. There we go. And there's going to be our extrapolated, our, the use, our delta T using our two extrapolated lines. There's minute four, and that's our delta T. So we ignore this tail in, yeah, because the reaction's still happening here, still getting colder, still getting colder. Oh, the reaction's slowing down, still got colder though. Now it's starting to warm up. Well, that one, I don't use this one here because it's actually still happening because it's not then a consist, that's not the same increase as the next bump. But now these ones are the same, which means these ones show that the reaction has truly stopped. Yeah, and therefore I can extrapolate using those, that linear, increase of temperature from an endo. So this is an endo graph. Yeah. And then this one here is an exo graph. You need to know both of these guys. They're going to ask you to plot them. The endo one is a bit more difficult because the problem is because, um, is that what you have been doing the whole time the same in the max as the maximum? What? Is that what you have been doing the whole time the same as the maximum temperature? What? Oliver, that doesn't make any sense. Explain. Huh? What do you mean? Is that the whole time I've been doing? The same as the maximum temperature. Right. No, no, no. Oh, okay, Oliver. So at GCSE, you guys have been dealing with maximum temperature. What a great, Oliver, I think I understand what you're doing here. So Oliver, this has been happening the whole time. Is it what you have been working out the same as working out finding the max temp. No. So hang on a minute. I'll put those lines back. So there's our delta T with the extrapolated line, Oliver. 
you've been taking at GCSE max T and max T is there. That's your max temp. That's your delta T at GCSE, lol. <laughs> and this is the delta T at A level. Isn't that cool? Seeing the evolution of internal calorimetry and how we can improve it. So that's the difference, Oliver. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, max T is your highest temperature achieved. But now we're using our extrapolated graphs to be able to take account for the heat loss. Cool that. If you did this one, GCSE, you got the green A level, your max, your max low T is there. That's going to be your delta T for GCSE, because you're just going to take them the, 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 the lowest temperature achieved in that reaction and not factoring in the heat loss. Or in this case, <laughs> heat gain. <laughs> Lol. Um, does that make sense? Cool. Thanks. No, what a great question. I've never done that. I've never shown the difference on those graphs between GCSE and A-level. And that's a really lovely addition to my lesson there, Oliver. Thank you. Yeah, I might give you some of that 7% back on your test that you lost by insulting me earlier. Thanks. Um, okay, so next. So we've now covered this learning objective. Practical steps for external. Uh, I'm going to skip that one since it is GCSE. I'll come back to it if I have enough time. Yeah, I'm going to go straight on to predicting rates from bond data. It's more A-level. Yeah, okay. So, um, predicting predicting uh, rates, predicting rates using bond data. Bond data. Right. So, now this one, uh, this particular part of energetics requires you to recall some of your GCSE organic chemistry. So we've got, we've got, uh, I wonder if anybody here, uh, I'm going to ask somebody, I'm going to ask Sian. Sian, can you name this, please? Name? Question mark? No. So we're going to look at this guy, and then we're going to look at, at this guy. And then we're going to look at this guy. Going to look at this guy, this guy. Going to look at this guy. I feel like I want to separate that one a bit more. I feel like my eyes aren't liking that very much. Is external calorimetry too inaccurate to plot a graph? Yes, Jim Joe, it is. <laughs> I can tell you why. The reason why, Jim Joe, what a great question. So the reason why, when you're doing external, by the way, you should never actually draw any, any scientific diagram as 3D, just so you know. When you take your calorimeter and you have your burner underneath it, whoop, you have your burner underneath it, like this. Look at that. Oh, that amazing diagram. Yeah. Fuel. Yeah, there's our fuel burner. Fuel burner. Right, and we then got our lovely little flame. Yeah. Oh, pretty flame. Hello, pretty flame. Hello. Let's do a bit of yeah, a bit of an orange. In there. Yeah. So here's the thing, Jim Joe. So you can do lots of things to make this better. You can add a draft shield. You can add a draft shield. This is called a draft shield. Yeah. You can add a lid to this. You've got to be careful though when you do that. You can have a lid on lid on it. Um, you can you can make the distance between the flame and the beaker as short as possible, but in reality, the the heat that's being lost like this, and due to things like wind, yeah. So I, I know the draft excluder is meant to prevent that, but what we realize is flames dance. I know that seems like a ridiculous thing to Google, isn't it? Not video. Definitely don't want to do that. But flames dance, they move around, and because their movement is so erratic, there's, what happens is, if you were to plot this, if you were to plot the temperatures of this, and you had the water before the flame, and then also, what you'd then do is you'd have to heat it up for a set amount of time, the graph would, uh, a minute, the graph would increase in temperature, but the problem is, this isn't, this isn't like you're heating it up for an unknown amount of time. And then when you, 
when you then take the flame away, yeah, and, and what will happen is this won't give you a consistent increase for a start. It would just be all over the place. Yeah, it would just be like, like, like this. Like it would constantly be going up, but it would just be everywhere. And then even if you then let it decrease, and you would then, you would probably then get a steady decrease. The problem is because the reaction has been so sporadic during that heating process due to moving around, you've got no consistent in, input of energy. So there's no point in plotting it because the heat energy being lost during these changes is going to vary massively due to a different amount being inputted. So it becomes a fruitless exercise. It's a really good question that, Jim Joe. I really liked that, well done. It's that garbage, external is just such a waste of time. We will get 30, 40% of what the book value says just due to heat loss and evaporation of water and all that jazz. Anyway, back to this. Okay, so I've got, uh, Sian still hasn't named this. I think she's abandoned me. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Oliver, can you name the top one? Can you name this one, Oliver? Can anybody on the chat now? Okay, so the name of this one, it'd be interesting to see how many people can put the name on. The name of this guy is fluoro, fluoromethane. Yeah, the next one is chloromethane. This is chloromethane. I'm now gonna ask anybody on the chat. Well, well mythine, I don't know what a mythine is. That, 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 that is hilarious. Um, <laughs> and then bromomethane, bromomethane, and then iodomethane, love it, iodomethane. Right, so what we're now going to do is we need to make a prediction. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do the reaction of these guys, we're going to do these as a reaction with silver nitrate with silver nitrate. Now it's actually a bit of an awkward thing this. I'm gonna put AgNO3 brackets aqueous. Now, I don't really wanna to get too much into the organics of this um, because you'll cover it later. It's quite nice to actually probably show you um, what's actually happening here. So what's actually ha going to happen here is that the, the fluoromethane isn't actually reacting with the silver nitrate itself. It's actually reacting with the water because it's aqueous. Because silver nitrate's an ionic solid. And what's going to happen is, uh, I'm tempted just to show you, this is a, a bit of a sneak peek at your organics. So here's what's going to happen. We've got fluoro, we've got fluoromethane. I shouldn't really have used this one, by the way, guys, because it's never really talked about. Because in reaction, in reality, this reaction doesn't really happen because the fluorine bond is so strong, but we're kind of coming to that. It reacts with water, and the water molecule has lone pairs of electrons on it, and they're going to attack the carbon because the carbon is slightly positive and the fluorine is slightly negative. And then that bond there is going to break. And what you're going to create is this. This is just a snare. I don't want you to, guys, I don't want you to worry about this. Yeah, I don't want you to worry about this. That oxygen now becomes fully positive. Don't worry that you don't understand that quite yet. That then breaks off. Yeah, that then breaks off. In reality, another water is actually taking this as an extractor, as a base, like that. I would do it properly if I'm even going to show it to you. And what I end up with is, is methanol. Yeah, and I also have the F minus ion floating around. Now, the F minus ion is now going to react <clears throat> with the silver one plus ion to form silver fluoride. Now, I've actually chosen a really bad example here because that is actually aqueous. So you don't even see anything happen with this reaction. So this reaction we can't include. I'm just gonna disregard that one. So the reason being is the fluoride is soluble. What we can do is use the others. So they're gonna do the same thing. And what I want you to realize is what we're going to get, we're gonna add silver nitrate aqueous. I don't need you to worry about any of this really guys. I just need you to know the outputs. What I'm going to get is I'm going to get methanol. I'm going to get, shouldn't do that. It's one of the worst things I hate 
as an organic chemist, I get methanol and silver chloride, which is a white precipitate. Okay, next. If I do this reaction here with silver nitrate, yeah, I get methanol, I get methanol and silver bromide, which is a cream precipitate. I wonder if you guys remember this from GCSE, the chemical tests for the halide ions. And then you do the same reaction with silver nitrate aqueous, and it has to be aqueous because it's an ionic solid. And we're going to get, I've got to show my H's, I'm doing it properly. And we're going to get, now I don't want you to get too lost in this, guys. What I need you guys to realize is that these reactions, you can watch them. So if we have this in a test tube, yeah, and we've got, we've got our haloalkane, so this is chloromethane, and this is our silver nitrate, yeah, so what's now going to have the reason why I've done them as blobs is because the chloromethane is insoluble. It just reacts slowly at the surface because um, chloromethane is a type of it's a type of alkane, even though it's a halo alkane, it's still a type of oil. So what will now happen is we will slowly see this turn white. Yet yeah, we will form we will form a white precipitate. Yeah, this is all I actually need you guys to realize. And I do the same thing, but this time. With, with bromomethane, and I will form a cream precipitate, an off-white cream. Let's see if I can find cream. There we go. I will form a cream precipitate, going from white to cream. Yeah, and then at the last one, I'm going to form a yellow. Now, the point I'm trying to make here with this is we need to look at the bond strengths. This one forms a yellow precipitate, and it really is actually pretty yellow, to be fair pretty yellow there we go so we get a white cream and yellow but the clever bit is who if we do these all at the same time who appears first and we can predict this so what bond are we having to break we are having to break the carbon chlorine the carbon bromine and the carbon iodine bond let's now have a look at those values so I'm going to do uh, bond enthalpies. Enthalpy images. And there we are. Right. So the carbon fluorine. Yeah, that's not going to happen. 4H5. So this one, even I don't even have to talk about that one. There's no point. Yeah. So, oh, oh, name blipped. So carbon chlorine, 328, I can't zoom in, I'm sorry guys, it won't let me zoom in on it, but they're there, yeah, 328, so that one there is a, that one there is 328, the next one is uh, carbon bromine, 276, 276, and the last one is the carbon iodine at 240, right, so, which one, having knowing these bond strengths, yeah, and knowing we're having to break them, which one is going, which precipitate is going to appear quicker in less time? On the chat, please. It's all about bond strength. It's all about the bond strength. Just to tell you, by the way, they're getting longer as well. Oh, they, they've got more shells. The halogen has more shells. Yeah, so this was a 348, this was 278 or something, and then this was 240, something like that. But were they? 328, so close. 328, and then 276, so close. And then 240. Iodine first, thank you, Oliver. Of course it is. So this one, the yellow precipitate is going to form in about 20 seconds. Yeah, this one is then the, the cream precipitate is going to form after about, it's about 100 seconds. It's much slower. And then the chlorine is more like 400 seconds. It's much, much longer. Yes, well done, Jim Joe. Well done, Wing Kit. Yeah, the yellow's going to appear first. Because the bond is just weaker and therefore breaks more easily. And what you realize is you can link this to a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Because what we realize is that if we look at this from a Maxwell-Boltzmann perspective, 
yeah, we realize that if we've got to break the carbon chlorine bond at three to eight, the activation energy is essentially, we can look at it as that number. And then that, that is going to be the activation energy, the EA. Yeah, that's the EA for the carbon chlorine. Well, if the next one, if the CBR bond is weaker at 276, then the activation and is just flat going to be smaller, which means all of these extra particles have the minimum energy required for a successful collision. And then we look at the carbon iodine bond, the carbon iodine bond being 240, we realize that that one's going to have an activation energy about there because we realize active en activation energy, the minimum energy required for a successful collision, definition for Excel. However, you can also consider it from a bond perspective, the energy required to break the original bonds. And so we realize that these now, so it's going to happen quicker. Isn't that cool how you can link it to a Maxwell Boltzmann? God's beautiful chemistry. Look at those notes. Aren't they lovely? They're so pretty. And you guys have asked such great questions today. So we can tick that one off now. We can predict reaction rates based on bond data. They make it very clear in the exam, if I'm honest. It's very straightforward. The next bit, practical steps in external. So we talked about external. I think I even drew a diagram. So practical steps for external. This is GCSE. Yeah, practical steps. So we have to, step number one, which is weigh the burner before. Weigh burner before. Yeah. Weigh the burner before. It's going to be, let's call it 50 grams. Yeah. And then we're going to... Uh, measured temperature temp of water of water before we also of course need the volume of water volume of water uh, the volume of water of course will give you the mass of water because one its density is one gram per centimeter cubed so we'd spit that so the temperature of the water before was 21 degrees celsius the volume let's call it 100 centimeters cubed which equates due to its density to 100 grams. That's going to be the M in Q equals MC delta T. Then we're going to do it. We're going to burn this for a, a, an amount of time. It doesn't even matter how long it is. And we're going to weigh the burner after. Yeah, weigh burner after. Now, can I just point out, by the way, that people often go, okay, so we can burn it for as long as we like. And you go, yes, you could burn it for as long as you like, but it's not a good idea. Yeah, you never want the temperature of the water to get to 100 because once it gets to 100, it can't increase any further. What that means is that you then not get the correct delta T. You also, the higher the temperature of the water gets, the bigger the heat loss. So if the, so you don't want to get it to like 60, 70, because the heat loss is going to be larger. So what you want to have is a small temperature change. You want to have kind of like 10, 15 degrees, no more. You can even go for less and that's okay. Also, the larger volume of water, by the way, the better as well, because the larger volume of water means the smaller the surface area to volume ratio, which means the lower the temperature, low, lower the heat loss as well. So loads of things here to consider. And I know I've just rushed through that. And I'm sorry that I haven't even written them down, but they'll come out in the wash as we go through this. So weight of burner after, let's call that um, 48.5 grams. Then we need the temp after. Temp of water after. Yeah. And let's call that one, let's call that one 35 degrees. I think that would be a really nice delta T. Yeah. And really, all I'm reminding you guys here is what everything is for. Yeah. We know that the weight of the burner before and the weight of the burner after, that's going to give us the mass of fuel. And when we run the process, so we know there are two equations. Q, I'm going to make my pen a bit thicker. Yeah, so Q equals MC delta T. This is all about the water. Yeah, and then we have divide by a thousand to put it into joule, into kilojoules. And then we have delta H equals Q over N. And the important bit is this N here is your fuel. For external, it's your fuel. And so that's where the weight of the burner before and after comes from. Yeah, and it's moles, so you have to then work out the MR of your burner, of your fuel, and then work out your mass change, and then do grams over rams to get your fuel, your, your moles of fuel burn. Um, and then, of course, these ones are all about the, the Q. Q equals MC delta T. I'm just reminding you of these, and I'm not, I know that I'm rushing through this. You can screenshot this, guys. For the graph of delta T, is the max temp then why does the temperature go down, then go up again? Ah, uh, okay. For the X, you're talking about this tail, yes, uh, Winkit? You're talking about this. 
it you've got to remember it's not going back up it's leveling out when kit yeah so just to explain so if you really wanted to do a ridiculous experiment and i mean like truly ridiculous first three first three minutes minute four blank yeah minute four no minute five minute six minute seven minute eight minute nine steady decrease starts to slow down it's not going back up it's returning back to the same starting temperature and there you go it's going to the same starting temperature that it was before it's not going back up winky yeah it's just simply returning and what we realize yeah so there you go it just returns back to what it was at the beginning sorry it's not perfect i am sketching this by hand yeah that would just be exactly the same yeah it's not going back up and the reason being is that as you approach room temperature, the heat loss will, will, will reduce. This is what I said earlier. So if you take something, if you take some, uh, a beaker of boiling hot water, 100 degrees Celsius water, and you take a beaker of the same volume of water, but this is at 50, yeah? What you realize is the heat loss will not be the same. Oh, sorry, I meant by the delta T greater than the max temperature recorded. Oh, because we're extrapolating Winkit. Because, because what you realize is through this process here, through this original time here, we're still losing heat, Winkit. We're losing heat all the time. We're losing it all the time. But what we realize is that these arrows, the heat loss that's being lost, of is the same amount we're making an assumption that it's exactly the same so what we can do is we can work out the size of these arrows by looking at the temperature decrease here so we can then factor in that heat loss in the original peak and we can say well we can work out what it would have been if there'd been no heat loss at all so this area here is the heat lost during the reaction we can never stop the heat loss. It's always going to be happening. As soon as we raise it above room temperature, we're losing heat. Yeah? And we can factor that in in the graph. I hope that makes sense. Okay, guys, that brings me to the end of my lesson. I'm done. So that brings us to an end of energetics. I've run out of time, sadly. So I'm, I, what I will do is the homework that I set you guys, which I had up and ready to go here, uh, I will... I will go through that. I'll, I can put the mark scheme up on the on the classroom if you like. Um, but I, I want to actually go through it to talk you through and show you where the pitfalls are of these. So I will go through that. Um, I might go through it at the end of the day. You know, um, today's an early finish. I might just do an extra one. It'll take me about four minutes, three to four minutes to do each one because energetics takes the time. So I'll do that at the end of the day, guys. Um, and then you can watch it then in your own time and mark it and then add discourse to the score sheet. Right, I will leave you be at this point. Guys, energetics is done. Whew. Energetics is done. And I hope you found it useful. And as I said, I will actually do a last energetics at the end of the day. I'll do that at about, uh, probably about one o'clock or so. Uh, maybe 1.30 after lunch. I'm free last lesson, so I'll just do it in my free. Uh, it means that you just get an, an, an extra energetics lesson to review bond energies and ask any other questions. Thank you. Not looking forward to the test on Tuesday. Oh, I'm sorry, Oliver. You'll do okay. I know it's a tough test. Use the support sheet. You know you've got millions of questions there to do. Talk to, yeah, just do as many questions as you can and then send me messages on Hangouts if you've got any questions. I'll see you guys soon. Take care.